the Smoking Mirror, Chapter 15, Part 2. A clanging sound broke the relative silence, and their dog-headed guard peered at them through their bronze bars of the cell door. You've a visitor, maggots, and she's a goddess, so keep your distance and know your place. The door swung open at his touch, and a short, dark woman swept into the cell. She wore a red cotton skirt and weepil, a sleeveless blouse, both items decorated with black crescent moons. The hem of her skirt was spattered with mud and what smelled like excrement, a mixture that smeared her bare feet and calves as well. Her long black hair was swept back in a braid, and atop her head sat a strange conical hat with white cotton tassels. Under expressive brown eyes, her broad nose was pierced by a crescent moon-shaped ornament fashioned of bone. A triangle of black spread its way across her mouth to end under her chin. In her right hand, she carried a rustic ancient broom. Whoa, Johnny muttered, an Aztec witch. The goddess leaned forward, sniffling at him. Ah, the smell of early puberty. You will have need of me later in life, little man. You will discover both sides of my nature. But to respond, no, I am not one of your European witches. The broom is for sweeping away filth, disease, and sadness. And the hat is a gift from my beautiful Huasteca people, crafted nearly three millennia ago. I am Ishquinan, the paradox, queen of sin and forgiveness. Carol nodded. She recognized their visitor now. She had read about her in one of her father's books. They also call you Tlazolteotl, don't they? Goddess of the life cycle. Ishquinan reached out her hand and patted Carol on the cheek. A warm, sisterly feeling spread throughout her soul. Indeed, I embody living movement from the moment of your birth to the final confession you make before death and all the earnest attempts at happiness in between. I urge you towards sin, but only so far, just enough to know its taste. Then I devour it for you allowing you to cleanly pass beyond. Ah, that explains the chapapote on your chin. Johnny didn't seem impressed by the presence of the goddess. Typical guy. Yes, Ishquinan replied, unperturbed. One day, if your soul chooses this route upon your death, your sin will stain my mouth as well, Juan Angel Garza. I suspect you will be less dismissive then. In any event, I have not come to sing my own praises. I'm here to offer you aid. Carol's eyes widened. Why would you help us? Ishquinan's free hand went to her dangling silver earrings, making them jingle musically. There are many residents of Shibalba who resent Tiscalipoca's heavy-handed usurpation of Miklan. It is true he established this place here at the root of the world tree, but its governance was placed in the hands of Lord and Lady Death. His interference runs counter to the natural order. I understand how frightening we must seem to you, but for thousands of years there was a discernible, noble purpose to our existence. As balance incarnate, I am disgusted by the Dark One's goal of universal destruction. He would like nothing better than for you two to be trapped in Shibalba, driven to despair by your inability to save your mother. Then would you either misuse your Shoshal, splitting the world tree, and freeing the Tsitsimime to wreak havoc upon the cosmos, or surrender that savage magic unto Tezcatlipoca's hand thereby ensuring the same end. No, you must leave this city, and quickly, too. We are few, those who dare flout his authority, but powerful, gods of vice and excess for the most part, like the Awi at the Deo, who would be nothing should humans cease to exist. Johnny smirked, great. 
Our new allies are the drunken junkie gods. Ishquinan laughed warmly. <laughs> uh, I believe they will enjoy that label. Clever boy. Do not discount our abilities, however. We will come for you soon and escort you to the next level of your journey. Till then, rest unburdened. She swept her broom in an arc that passed over both their hearts. Instantly, Carol felt refreshed and energized, as if a great weight had been lifted from her soul. Before she could speak her thanks, the door swung open, and the guard spoke brusquely. Lady Isquinan, your pardon, but your time with the humans is at an end. The goddess smiled her teeth gleaming white against the stain of sin. For a moment, her features blurred, and an older, wizened face seemed to shine from behind her flesh. Then she spun about, her braid whistling through the air, and hurried from the cell. Several hours later, rescue had still not come. Johnny raised his eyebrows pointedly, nodding at the cell door. Uh, looks like the drunken junkie gods are too high to save us. Figures. Carol sighed. I'm sure they just got delayed or something. Mm, maybe. Or maybe the Ish Queen was doing Tescott's will, faking us out, making us freaky even more. Carol didn't want to believe that, but when the cell doors opened to reveal the city guard, waiting to escort them to their deaths, she collapsed inwardly. I guess I thought I saw something in her that wasn't there. The virgin, Donanzin, some spirit of sisterhood that can make her my ally. From their cells, the twins were led along a narrow tunnel that angled upward till it ended right at the temple's base. Thousands of were-creatures, demons, and monsters thronged about the ziggurat, and as soon as I'm sorry. As Carol and Johnny emerged, a roar of excitement went up that set the very ground to trembling. Hey, cool. Johnny smiled and winked. We're famous. All the demons are cheering us. They're excited to see a sacrifice, Johnny. Yeah, but that's something, no? He laughed and turned to the guards. Famous, notorious, mm, all the same, huh, guys? Shut up and climb the stairs, human, the captain growled resting the shield from Johnny's grasp. Sheesh! Her brother's hand shot into the air in an exaggerated gesture of exasperation. I'm going, dude! Hello! My adoring fans wait! Gotta give them a heartfelt performance, no? <laughs> All my Shibalban rivals will just eat their hearts out, seriously. Carol rolled her eyes and groaned. Is this really the time for your cheesy jokes? They're gonna kill us. We won't die. You even said it. The little one, little people have our backs. I'm guessing the lords of nasty are gonna yank out the pieces of jade. Yeah, well, I've been thinking about that. Aren't they going to notice that those aren't our hearts? Won't they just, I don't know, reach back in and remove the real ones? I think we just have to have faith, Carol. There's really nothing else we can do. If Quetzalcoatl or God or whoever wants us to get Mom and defeat Tezcat, they're gonna have to step up and protect us. I'm done worrying. The guards prodded them roughly, and Carol began to climb. The steps were steep and slick, but thankfully the pyramid sides were slanted at relatively comfortable angle. Nonetheless, after finishing the first set of steps, standing on a broad stone landing upon which the second level of the ziggurat had been built, her leg muscles burned fiercely. By the time they'd reached the third such landing, Carol was out of breath, red-faced, and sweating like mad. Panting, Johnny gasped sarcastically, Oh, good workout, huh? Gotta recommend it to my jock friends. Oh, wait, I hate jocks. Oh, now I'm really recommending it. Especially the prize they get when they reach the top mm -hmm. a guard shoved him toward the last flight of steps carol followed quickly not wanting any more prodding from those painful clubs she kept her eyes down focusing on her aching feet postponing the need to look up at the temple proper finally though she reached the top and had to take in the tableau the cube-shaped temple sported a large obsidian mirror which faced her Immediately in front of it was a huge stone receptacle in the shape of a jaguar, its back hollowed out to receive 
she imagined, the hearts of sacrificial victims. Between that basin and the twins rose the altar, a massive slab of granite mottled with stains that were, um, certainly old blood. Whew. 260 freaking steps, Johnny stretched his joints popping. Oh, so you got my bed ready. Perfect. I am super tired. Arranged on either side of the temple were the Ahalab, the red and green lords to Carol's left, the black and white to her right. From within the temple, High Lord Kisin emerged. He now wore a black robe that reached his bare feet. His face was painted black, and a black powder that smelled to Carol's heightened senses like crushed scorpions and spiders had been rubbed into his forearms and, and neck. In his left hand, he twirled a deadly-looking obsidian blade. Indeed, his gaunt face spread in a wicked smile. Then do climb right up, living boy, and rest a while. Johnny shrugged, but Carol could hear his heart pounding as he approached the slab and pulled himself onto it. Immediately, a lord from each of the four quarters of Shipalba moved forward and took a hold of an arm or leg, immobilizing her brother. Kisin moved toward him, brandishing the blade. He began chanting in some dark, ancient tongue. A shadowy force gathered in the air like silent oblivion, and smoke began to pour from the mirror, curling its way along the top of the pyramid, twisting around the altar's base. O Tezcalipoca, lord of the near and the nigh, night wind, enemy of both sides, receive this life that we end for you, and may such a death herald many more until darkness pervades the living world and Miklan erupts upon the earth. Carol felt her brother's thin courage falter as the knife blurred upward in the High Lord's hand. Wait, he cried, and his soul struck out wildly, despairing. Carol could bear no more. Mustering all of her energy, she opened her mouth to sing, intending to send away notes of pure Teotl pounding against Kisin. The first quavering note had barely left her lips when he shook his head and pointed his free hand at her, closing his fingers together in a gesture of silence. Enough of your twittering, little beard. She found herself frozen in place, unable to move or speak as a black blade sliced through the air. Don't look. Johnny's last thought flitted through her heart, but she couldn't avert her eyes. Kisin cut open her brother's chest, hacking through his shirt, and with a deft movement, he plunged his hand inside and drew forth a pulsating red mass. He lifted it high into the air and was immediately rewarded by the raucous cheers of thousands of monsters in the streets below. Then, with a fiendish flourish, the High Lord tossed the heart into the hollow in the back of the stone jaguar. The four lords released Johnny's limbs as he went limped. Kisin motioned to the guards. Send this filth rolling down the steps. Let the Awiatateo and their ilk feast on his flesh. The guards seized Johnny's body roughly and prepared to flip him over the edge. The captain of the guard, however, interrupted them. Here, set him on his shield and let's... Watch him rush at them willy-nilly. Carol wanted to scream, but her throat was locked. The undead soldiers dropped Johnny's unmoving form into the curve of the stolen shield and sent him rocketing down the steps of the ziggurat. Kisin crooked his fingers at her, and against her will, Carol moved toward the slab. With jerky movement, she climbed atop it and lay down, her brother's blood warm and sticky beneath her back. The four lords wrapped dead hands around her ankles and wrists as Kisin intoned his ancient chant. Sinking deeper into herself, Carol tried not to listen, tried not to see. The knife arced up through the gray sky, and she fled from consciousness before it could fall.